Welcome back to Spectre of Torment. Last time we went through the plains and took on Black Knight, though we couldn't recruit him to the Order of No Quarter. And we also explored the tower, seeing what goodies we could grab and what information we could gather. And a pretty important piece of information was something that Missy told us, Missy being the lady that handles the wisps, though I really should give her a better description than just that. If you were to miss a wisp within a level, then that wisp would appear in Missy's shop. You can buy it from her for a certain amount of gold, or you can go back into the level and try to find it on your own. And usually the wisps are going to cost 4,000 gold, except for one case, and that is the very first wisp in the game, the one in the plains. That one instead costs 1,000 gold, though I highly doubt anyone's going to be missing that one unless they do so on purpose. There is actually a feat for missing all the wisps in the game, so that might be a reason for not getting any of them. Speaking of feats, there is actually an incorrect statement that I made last time that I want to correct. I said that there was a feat for getting 6,000 gold and beating the game without having repeated any levels or minigames while holding that 6,000 gold. That was actually incorrect. It was 60,000 gold that you need to have on hand when you beat the game. Though I still think that the feat is a pretty easy one. There are a lot of ways to not spend money in this game, unlike in the other two campaigns. Rather than having to pay for relics or bomb components or upgrades to your health and magic, instead we just find them within the levels. The red skulls we trade in for curios, and the wisps are what upgrade our will and darkness. So no money spent there. As for the actual information that we got from Missy, she told us the locations of all the Darkness Wisps. There's one in the Exploratorium, one in the Lich Yard, as I recall, and one in the Clockwork Tower. I want to go after all of these first because I want to have as much darkness as possible as early as possible so I could get rid of the Raiment of Risk as soon as possible. Not that I don't like the Raiment of Risk, it's actually my favorite piece of armor, and I'll tell you exactly why right now. If you were to destroy a checkpoint while wearing the Raiment of Risk, you'll get powered up. Although there are some slight negative side effects to it. You will be reduced back down to 4 health, no matter what your max health was, even if it was at 10, you're going down to 4. Though that's really it for all the negatives. In terms of positives, your darkness is constantly regenerating, not at as fast a pace as, say, Plague Knight's power meter, but it's regeneration nonetheless, and you don't have that normally, so I'll take it. And the main attraction, in my opinion, is the powered up scythe slash. When performing a regular slash, not a dash slash, you'll actually send out this shockwave and the shockwave does the same amount of damage as your normal slash, though if you hit enemies in the right sweet spot, you can actually do two hits of damage rather than just one. The way it works is if the enemy is too close, they're only getting hit by the scythe, so it only does one. If the enemy is too far, they're only getting hit by the shockwave, so it just does one. But if the enemy is getting hit by both the shockwave and the scythe, or maybe just the shockwave itself because it lingers, for a little too long, in my opinion, that's what kind of makes it overpowered, they're going to get hit twice and most minor enemies are going to go down in one hit. That's kind of why I don't want to keep this on. It absolutely shreds bosses as well. Like, you can just kind of stand still and continuously press the attack button and bosses will go down really, really quickly. Right here I'm showing examples of a couple of things. First off, that the Fairy of... I was going to say Fairy of Plaguey. No, Fairy of Chivalry will actually attempt to destroy the checkpoints. And that you can actually do just one damage with your Scythe when you have the Raymond of Risk ability. As you might have seen with that slime that I showed earlier. As for the level's gimmick, it's obviously different from what it was in the original campaign. This time there's a lot of rushing water everywhere. And the rushing water can do a couple of things. First, 
It'll slow you down or speed you up, depending on whether or not you go with the flow or against it. And when there are bombs dropped on it, then those bombs will kind of split off in two directions going along with the water. So, uh, be careful of that, I guess. And they don't just move horizontally, either, the, uh, bombs. They also move vertically, so if they, say, come to the edge of a little path of water and the water is still flowing downward, then that bomb, or rather the residue of the bomb, is still going to travel down that waterfall and then once it hits more water underneath it, it'll continue traveling. Basically until they hit a wall is when they stop, or you know, if there were like a cliff to fall off of. As for the bombs themselves, there is, well there are, rather, certain areas where the bombs are going to be coming out of the walls. It's pretty easy to tell, in my opinion, and you can slash at the bombs in order to make them go up into the air, which is how you get the darkness wisps in this level. Basically, you just wait for a bomb to come out of one of those ventilation shaft kind of things, and you shoot it up into the air where it can destroy a platform for you, or rather, a ceiling for you. Another thing about the Raymond of Risk is that if you hit a dirt pile with the shockwave, then it destroys it in one hit. So that's pretty neat. It also gives you vertical range rather than just horizontal range. So in that case that I explained just now where you'd slash out a bomb in order to get it to hit the ceiling, you can actually slash with the Raymond of Risk, I believe, if you're precise enough, and it'll destroy the wall or the ceiling for you. I just cannot say the word ceiling today. In terms of enemies, there aren't really any new ones except for one. There's a different kind of bone cling that rather than just standing still and slashing at you slowly, he will actually lunge at you, or she will actually lunge at you. You can't really tell with the skeletons. But that's really the only new enemy in this area. The beetles, the birds, the minions, they're all the same as usual. There is going to be another enemy right up this ladder. And it's that treasure chest. You can tell by the face that it's not actually a treasure chest. This is a Memek. This appears in multiple levels. It's not really unique to this one, which is why I didn't count it. And the way it works is you basically attack a bunch of times and it drops a ton of money. Although, if it does end up attacking you, you're going to take a lot of damage. I think a full dot or two. Well, maybe just one full dot. So, be cautious with those things. They aren't really that big of a deal, though, when you have the Raymond of Risk's extra range. And we're pretty much at the end of the level right now. This is the final checkpoint. Something I didn't mention about the Raymond of Risk, if you do fall in battle while having the power-up effect on, you will actually lose it until you destroy another checkpoint. And if you're like me and you destroy all the checkpoints within a level, then you're going to have to go all the way back to the start, for one thing. But you won't be able to have the power when you go back to the boss because all the checkpoints are already destroyed. As for the boss himself here, Plague Knight has a single new trick. He can create a copy of himself that he sends around and jumps and sends bombs and such. It's basically exactly like him except they can only take two hits rather than the, I don't know, 20 that Plague Knight can take. But because I have the extra Raiment of Risk scythe slash power up thing, he's really not that big of a deal. Not any of the bosses are that big of a deal, honestly. I think they're all pretty easy. Though, because they are changed slightly, I will say that the scale of difficulty is quite different. Because we have more red skulls, we can change, well, trade them, they don't really change into anything, for more curios. This first one that we're getting is the throwing sickle. It doesn't cost very much, and it's essentially a boomerang. You throw it forward, and it'll come back to you if it doesn't hit anything. Sadly, even if the enemy only has one hit left, it won't go through the enemy. No matter what it hits, it's going to fail. Well, I mean, it'll still get the damage in. 
but it'll fall and it won't come back to you, which is kind of lame. And if it does end up coming back to you, you won't get that darkness that you spent on it back, which is kind of weird, I guess. Because in some Mega Man games, when they had boomerang weapons, if the boomerang went back to you, you actually got your weapon energy back. So it's it's something you might have to get used to if you're used to the way boomerangs work in the Mega Man games. As for this other curio, this is the Bounding Soul. It's the one you unlock for purchase after beating Plague Knight. So certain curios are actually locked behind certain bosses. And this one does exactly what's on the tin. It bounds around. It bounces off of walls at 90-ish degree angles. So you can get some pretty cool trick shots, I guess. Like the throwing sickle, it only does one damage, and once it hits an enemy, it dissipates. They're pretty similar, and both pretty lame. I don't like using them very much. Up here, we have a minion and Plague Knight. The minion actually gives us some money, and he talks about how Plague Knight doesn't actually have an extra secret hideout that he isn't talking about, even though if you've played Plague of Shadows, you would know that that is a lie. We're going to change the gold armor's armor color again after talking to this, uh, well, I guess we're going to do it right now. We'll talk to him after talking to this jar over here and offering the rest of the money we can. We'll get the feat, the spirit of giving for giving all of the money to both of the jars. And this one doesn't have the same function as the last one. This one instead powers up your curios. Every curio that you power up costs 4,000 gold. Some of them are more useful than others. I think the Dread Talon and the Will Skull are pretty great. The Will Skull instead refills 4 health rather than... Or, no, it refills 3 health rather than 2. And the Dread Talon is now super armored, so you can't get interrupted while performing it. And it sends out a shockwave when you attack with it, so you have a lot more range. As for what the Throwing Sickle and Bounding Skull get... The Throwing Sickle and Bounding Skull both have the ability to, I think, retrieve gold and go through enemies. So you can actually get multiple hits when using both of them if you power them. But I'm not going to do so because I think the Dread Talon is all I really need. And the second level we're doing is the second level from... Well, I guess it could be the second level from the other campaigns. It's what I chose as the second level in the other campaigns. The Lich Yard. It's pretty different from last time. You can actually see that there's some residential stuff going on, which is pretty interesting. And this frog is very douchily placed because I have died many a time to that frog, either trying to kill it or getting hit by it and being knocked back into a pit or something like that. It is very annoying to try and deal with. The way I usually dealt with him previously actually was using the Dread Talon, but that would also end up getting me into a bottomless pit. So I'd uh, just tank the hit this time. Or if you had the powered up Dread Talon, essentially go inside of him and attack. That's the best advice I can offer. Or, you know, use some of those curios that I don't actually use. The Bounding Skull, the Throwing Sickle. Use those to actually try and get some hits in on him. The boss of this level is actually the Phantom Striker, which is kind of odd. You wouldn't expect a uh, mini-boss, I guess you could call him, or a field encounter, is what I'd rather say, actually, to be a boss of a level, but there he is. For some reason, they chose not to use Shovel Knight, which I guess is fine. Shovel Knight isn't really... A player in this game at this point considering this is the prequel if you head to the left in that dark area and come down here by basically jumping on a breakable area you'll find a secret area guarded by the super skeleton who only lets Spectre Knight in it's Spectre Knight's room so you get the get out of my room feet here as well there isn't really much going on here, no beds to jump on, no masks to look at. 
interestingly, it actually kind of... How should I put this? It's more... For Spectre Knight's old life, I guess you could say. Like, it doesn't really have a lot that pertains to as he is right now. It's for when he was alive. And you might get some hints as to who Spectre Knight hung out with, I guess, if you look around in that room. Another thing about that room is actually, if you destroy some of the paintings on the walls, then one of the uh, ghost enemies will actually come out and haunt you for a little bit. Again, they are unkillable this time. I don't know why I said this time, but they're unkillable, so don't bother with them too much. These gravestone guys, or headstone, I don't know. They're a new enemy. They're pretty bulky. They take six regular scythe hits, I think, or maybe five. And I would recommend not using the dash slash on them, because that takes too long. There's too much delay between dash slashes, and they will be able to get a lunge in at you. And that lunge takes away a full dot of health, which is... No bueno. Speaking of, you know, changing things with the level design and the enemies and such, the weight thing that was in the other versions of this level is no longer here, where you had to get the skeleton heads on the platforms to weigh it down so you could actually progress. No longer in this level. Instead, it's replaced by two other gimmicks. One of them being this right here, invisible platforms that appear only when you step on them. They're still there even if you don't step on them, as shown by this skeleton over here. So you can kind of let enemies live to figure out where you can stand and where you can't. I pretty much have them memorized though, so I don't really need to do that. And for some reason, those skeletons won't go all the way over here even though there's clearly land that allows you to get over there. It's kind of odd. I wonder how they, uh, how they got that to work, considering that the skeletons usually continuously move until they reach an edge or a wall. Something that I really don't like, or didn't like, about the Fairy of Chivalry here, is how he's constantly crying in this version of the game. He doesn't do that in Plague of Shadows or in uh, Shovel of Hope, as I recall, and he doesn't do it anymore in Spectre of Torment, which kind of made me want to re-record everything because I was like, damn it, the, the fairy isn't crying anymore and it's not annoying me anymore. The reason the fairy cries usually is because your character is dead, and since Spectre Knight is technically undead, then... I thought, well, maybe because he's undead, they decided let's have the Fairy of Chivalry constantly crying. And honestly, I think that's kind of dumb. So I'm glad that they took that out and I have no qualms with the Fairy anymore. Making my statement in the last part kind of moot. Here's the other gimmick in the level. These blue flames. If you slash at them with your scythe, then they'll go out. Only for a little bit of time though, maybe like 3 seconds tops. You can constantly slash in the same area in order to keep the fire out. And having the Raiment of Risk's extra range actually is pretty useful here. Because it means you won't have to... How should I put it? For certain cases, you won't have to be as careful as usual. Like a case that's about to come up right now. If I would actually turn around and go toward it. This skeleton over here, I'm going to kill him without dash slashing into him. And I honestly should have dash slashed into him, because if I did, that would have put out the fire. But because I have the raiment of risk, I have extra range, and I can put out more fire and give myself more leeway in order to make the jump to that platform and actually get the red skull and treasure chest that was back there. You might not have noticed because I do kind of have the uh, music low. But the music is actually different from in the other campaigns. For Plague of Shadows, they pretty much use the same songs with a few extra ones in uh, some specific Plague Knight areas. 
But in this version of the game, instead, every song is remixed. And in my opinion, the remixes are pretty much better than the original versions in all cases. So I'm glad they did that. For this area right here, I actually like to think that Spectre Knight making that hole is actually the reason why the center of this area is a hole in the other two campaigns. In the other two, it's actually covered by a wall, so it's an invisible hole. But it makes sense that in this one, you destroy it, so that's why there is an invisible hole there. Because originally, Spectre Knight made that hole. And this last bit is kind of copy-pasted from the original version, just a lot of darkness and platforming with these moving red platforms with some bone clings on the platforms that you can destroy. Although here the bone clings are more for targeting, you can perform a downward dash slash on them and pretty much land safely on a platform. And here we are at the boss, of course. As I said, this is the Phantom Striker, rather than being Shovel Knight or something like that. And they give you a little a little trick this time around. They actually send you to a new area. And Phantom Striker is probably the boss that got the buff most in this game. Like, he is way different. Well, not way different, but he's a lot stronger than in the original version of Shovel Knight. At least in my opinion he is. There's a lot of extra stuff going on in this version. He likes to teleport around a lot more. He leaves lingering electric balls sometimes on certain parts of the stage. And he can actually summon lightning rather than just do that weak wind pushing thing from previously. Though again, I have the raiment of risk so I can shred him like nothing else. He will actually block some of your attacks with his little rapier that he uses. So that can get kind of annoying. But because of the extra shockwave, it's really no big deal. Of course, we know that in the future, he's not actually going to be a part of the Order of No Quarter. And he's just going to leave. So, uh, bye, Mr. Guy. And now for something a little different. Rather than just closing the locket and going to the next level, we instead get a little reverie. We're having a little flashback sequence with Lewin here and Donovan. Donovan being the name of Spectre Knight, we can assume, because Black Knight called Spectre Knight Donovan when he recognized his fighting style. And yeah, the fighting style is pretty much exactly the same. He has the same range, he can do the same moves, the only difference being really cosmetic. And also, he has life and item instead of uh, will and darkness, which is pretty interesting. He also has a relic, which isn't very much of anything, honestly. The cow traps are just little spike traps that you can leave. They do the same amount of damage as your sword. They're really just for you to let enemies run into, honestly. They're not all that special in my opinion. They're also an unmissable item. If you were to miss them in this run through the level, or rather, if you were to miss them in this level, you will be getting them at a later point in another level, so... You kind of have to deal with them. Something I wanted to talk about last level was the room that Spectre Knight was in, and I did talk about it a little bit. But, it kinda... How should I put it? It's kinda weird that he would have a room in the Lich Yard that has a lot of his memories in it, I guess you could say. Because Spectre Knight doesn't rule the Lich Yard in this version of the game, at least not right now. So why would he have a room there, unless he struck a deal with the Super Skeleton while he was a human. I don't know, it's just kind of weird. For some reason, the fairy of chivalry follows you, and he doesn't cry. Which is crazy. 
so I'm thinking my previous theory was actually true that he cried because Spectre Knight was technically dead. And I bet, I bet as soon as he comes back in, he's going to start crying again. If I could close the locket. Let's see. Oh, he actually wasn't. Well, see you next time.